Okay, so what we're going to start talking about now is how populations evolve. So in the first lecture, we we're going through evolution, what it is, Darwin, Cuvier, Lamarck, you know, different people involved in it. And then more importantly, the lines of evidence for evolution to say this is evolution in action. We can see it. We can see factors that cause it. It's definitely an important thing to remember. What is the scientific evidence behind evolution? You know, the fossil record, the anatomy, the molecular data, biogeography, all those things support evolution. So now we're going to actually look at how do we know if a population evolves? How do we say, ooh, that is evolving or that has evolved? So the key here is looking at something that we can watch lots of generations happening. So elephants we're not going to be able to sit down and watch an elephant species evolve because they live a long time and we don't have the opportunity to witness a lot of generations. But viruses, stuff like HIV, HIV replicates constantly. We can watch millions of generations of HIV virus change and evolve within the host. So a person becomes infected with HIV, we can watch that virus evolve in that host over 10, 15, 20 years. Same thing with bacteria. You know, we see bacteria evolve because it reproduces sometimes in 20 minutes. So in the course of a day, you're watching hundreds of bacterial generations. That's the type of stuff we can actually watch and witness evolution occurring in. All right, so when we're looking at evolution, what we're going to look at first is this idea called microevolution. These are small changes within the genotypic frequencies of a population. All right, so can we actually watch a population evolve and see those changes occurring? Well, we watch the genotypes, how many big A's versus little A's in the population. All right, so again, a key thing about evolution with any population, you have to have variation. So we look at all these snails, they're all the same species, but look at the variation on color. Now, what happens each generation? Do we see some variations becoming more common and other variations becoming less common? That is based on the genotype. And if the genotypic frequency changes, we would then say the population is undergoing evolution. It might undergo only a small evolution, micro, but that's still evolution. Does it undergo a big evolution, what we call macro? We need to watch it for a long, long, long time to possibly witness macro. All right, so there is actually a mathematical formula that we use to actually calculate these frequencies. It's called the Hardy-Weinberg Principle. So this hopefully connects back to the genetics unit. We talked about genetics and we looked at big A versus little a allele, dominant versus recessive, and so on. So the allele frequency of a population is measured by this equation P plus Q equals 1. P representing the dominant allele, big D in this example. Q representing the recessive allele little d. So what we look at in the population is how many big D alleles exist in a population versus how many little d alleles. What are the frequencies? Now again, big D in this example is going to give us a dark moth color, whether you're homozygous or heterozygous, and then the little d's give us the light moth color, but you have to be homozygous recessive. So we want to look at and understand what are the frequencies of these alleles and then what happens the next generation and the next generation and the next and the next and let's watch it for hundreds of generations and see do we have frequencies changing. All right, so the frequency of the allele is measured in the generation and then measured again and again and again. And, and if you have change in frequency, we will say evolution is occurring. And we'd probably say, you know what, if it's only shifted a couple percent, 
we're going to call it microevolution. Now, if there is no change in the frequency, then the population is not evolving. It's not changing. That happens. Populations can stay stable. Now, Cuvier would have argued populations don't ever change. So you watch this population for a thousand years and you're never, ever going to see a change. But that's not the case. So Cuvier's catastrophism will be or is proven wrong. It's not supported <clears throat> because the data and the evidence shows populations changing. So we would reject, <coughs> excuse me, reject Cuvier's hypothesis based on the scientific data and the evidence we have. So here's an example of a case in which this was actually watched and witnessed with moths. So you got these peppered moths. They come in dark varieties down here, and they come in the lighter variety up here. And in 1848, Dr. Kettlewell was watching these moths and looking at moth frequencies. Only 5% of the population was dark. 95% was light. So the vast majority of these moths were a, dark, were a light variation back in the 1840s. Keep in mind, light is recessive. Dark is dominant. Dr. Kettlewell found, wow, hardly any dark moths. They still occasionally show up, but mostly they're all light. Industrial revolution sets in, and coal is being burned to produce energy. And just like today, back in the 1800s, when coal was burned, it produces pollution, produces soot. That's a byproduct of burning coal. So as that black soot came out of the factories in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, etc., it started to change the color of the environment. It started to pollute the environment, and those trees were darker. They were getting covered in soot because the pollution of the coal. And what we saw happen was being a dark moth actually became more beneficial, and being light was less adaptable because you're standing out now in a dark environment and predators are going to kill you easier. So the frequencies of these moth, moth genetics shifted radically in less than 50 years. Almost all the light moths disappeared because they were not adaptable in that environment. So in this environment, think about the one the predators are going to kill, the dark moth. And if you can't see it, the light moth is right down here. That's pretty good camouflage. How are you going to survive? You blend in. Your children will blend in. Your grandchildren will blend in if the environment stays like this. But with industrial revolution and the burning of fossil fuels, now all of a sudden your environment changes. And what worked for your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents to blend in in that light environment no longer blends in in the dark environment. So the environment played a huge role in what is considered adaptable. This is why we saw the frequencies of, the frequencies of those moth colors change by 1895. Now anti-pollution laws come in the picture in the 1900s. People start cleaning up the environment and the environment goes starts moving back towards the lighter, cleaner environment, and the moth frequencies start shifting back towards the original frequencies. Not completely there by 1895, but getting closer to the 5 and 95 percent frequencies <coughs> than what we obviously had in the 1895. So that is one very simple, quick, easy example of microevolution. There's still moths, but we can see frequencies changing. All right, now let's watch them for another 100 years, 200 years, 2,000 years, 3,000 years. Are there going to be significant differences? We need to wait and see. In the next lecture series, the next chapters, we'll talk about how do we know when enough changes have occurred to call you a different species. So we'll get into that topic down the road. But the goal with Hardy-Weinberg is to determine if the allele frequency has changed over time. It's like watching teeter-totter. 
Did the teeter-totter shift? Did it change? Did the frequencies tilt? That's what we're studying when we're looking at microevolution. Can you actually track genetic frequencies and see them change? All right. So in any given population, there will be five factors that will contribute to the change in allele frequency. All right. So if any of these five factors are present, your frequencies will change. Now, how fast they change, there's no way to predict that. The degree of change, there's no way to predict that. But I guarantee if these factors are present, allele frequencies will shift, which will lead to microevolution. The challenge here is, could you, even in a laboratory environment, could you block evolution from occurring? you'd have to eliminate all five of these factors to say evolution is not going to happen. All right, so a perfect example in front of us every day, antibiotic resistance. Bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. That is microevolution in action. Okay, we see it all the time. This is why penicillin doesn't work on certain infections. This is why this one doesn't work anymore. Those are species that have evolved within our lifetime and they reproduce so quickly we can watch thousands and millions of generations of bacteria and actually see that in action. But if somebody says, well, I want to see a fish turn into a, a frog, then I'll believe in evolution. Well, can you watch it for the next two and a half million years? Probably not. That's the reality. Some things we can prove and see and witness, other things, we use the evidence to su support the fact that it does evolve or it has evolved. Okay, so let's take a look at <clears throat> excuse me, these five factors. Definitely a thing to remember. Five factors that lead to evolution. The first one, mutations. Mutations. Changes in the DNA of a species. This can lead to a new genotype, which can then lead to a new phenotype, which can lead to new traits, which can lead to increased success. And if that makes you more successful, then you're probably going to be able to reproduce more. You're going to have more kids that are successful because of that new trait and on and on and on and on. So we talked about mutations back when we were looking at molecular biology. DNA can change at the drop of a hat, like that. Switch out a piece of DNA, a new amino acid is brought into the picture, changes the protein, all sorts of things can happen. Sometimes mutations are bad, they kill it. Okay, it's dead. Other times mutations are great and they increase your survival. But the reality is we can't block mutations from happening. We can't go into a lab and control the DNA replication process in a fruit fly and say, no mutations. doesn't work. This is always going to be present. Now, it's not probably going to be a massive amount of change from a mutation, and it's going to take a long time for those to potentially accumulate and produce results, but they're going to be there. That's going to be there in, a, in every single population. All right, another factor, gene flow. Gene flow is when, oops, one, or, gene flow is when organisms move from one population to another. This changes the allele frequency of the populations. Not just the one you're moving into, but the one you left behind. That allele frequency is going to shift because you've now taken alleles out of it and you've brought alleles into it. So this definitely applies to migrating populations. Think about geese that fly across the world or these herds of wildebeest as they come together and small groups merge into a big group. Populations are always changing in their allele frequency when new individuals move into your population or they move out of it. All right, so those are the first two factors. In the next lecture, 
We're going to take a look at the other three factors and then how they combine to create new variables.